Uh, my name is Sarah Seip. I am a colleague of Professor Slavov at Parallel Square Technology Institute. Uh, and I am pleased to be introducing Jurgen Cox this morning. Um, he is a bit of a local, did his PhD nearby at MIT, but is currently at the Max Planck Institute for Biochemistry in Martinsried, Germany. Um, he has lent his experience and expertise in computational systems biology to the field of mass spectrometry-based proteomics. His notable contrib uh, contributions include uh, programs that I personally use very often, including MaxQuant and uh, Perseus. A few years ago, however, MaxQuant expanded into the realm of DIA. And so today, Jurgen will be uh, telling us more about the accurate and sen sensitive uh, Plex DIA within MaxQuant. Please give it up for Jurgen. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction and also for uh, allowing me to be part of this uh, very nice workshop uh, conference. So very, thank you very much for that. So, okay, so what am I going to do today indeed? So I will give you the, the latest about the progress in uh, Max Quant uh, programming uh, regarding DIA and in particular that will of course pertain also to multiplex uh, DIA uh, that, that Nikolai was actually pioneering. And um, so it will be a broad overview of what the version that is that was coming out now so actually today there's a new version coming out that has or that is already uh, has already been coming out that has all of these capabilities um, that I will be talking about so indeed a couple of years ago I think it should be like four years or something like now uh, like that we started uh, with uh, DIA support within Max Quant. so so until then it was actually more known for uh, DDA shotgun proteomics and um, nevertheless, uh, we thought it's a good idea to actually reuse all of these things that are in there also for data independent acquisition. And um, so there are, um, yeah, so these uh, main five topics that I will uh, um, cover today. So, so first and uh, foremost, uh, so the on the fly library. Um, prediction capability, which might not be a big deal, uh, but nevertheless, I think that's something that many users were waiting for, meaning that you don't need to uh, download and silico predicted libraries anymore, but you just give the FASTA file, which could be any, and it could also be any protease rule that you uh, define for it. And uh, the, the library is just predicted on the fly, as it says, basically, right? Then um, there's news uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, multiplexed uh, label capabilities of MaxQuant. And then we uh, will briefly look into how the MaxLFQ algorithm works for multiplexed uh, DIA. Uh, and then there are two uh, new features that are also interesting in terms of in getting the last uh, in performance identification and quantification wide, uh, wise out of DIA data, which is uh, so-called what we call sequence coverage increase and uh, the peptide uh, correlation filtering. So let's get into um, the first one. So already mentioned so far, it was actually the case that the in silico predicted libraries had to be uh, downloaded from uh, from uh, from a server, uh, from a central server. And these were predicted with a recurrent uh, neural network method uh, so, um, yeah, which was called a deep mass. So it's also very, quite similar to ProSit, if you know that better. Uh, so it's a deep learning uh, technique to predict uh, spectral libraries. And it was, uh, so because it was uh, always this download step was involved, it was kind of restricted. I'm mean, not really uh, strictly, but uh, practically, it was a little bit restricted to triptych peptides with maybe one uh, miscleavage and uh, like standard charge states. And this is now all overcome. So you just uh, specify a FASTA file within MaxQuant as you would also do it uh, for DDA um, data analysis. And uh, from that, uh, it goes then automatically predicts in silico library um, with uh, whatever protease uh, you, um, you specify. And this is not done with uh, recurrent neural networks anymore, but we use uh, uh, what uh, we use XGBoost as, as like the core machine learning uh, technology uh, behind this. And this is uh, working quite simplistically on window features that are like centered around the bonds that you want to predict the, the breakability for basically. Right? And um, yeah, as I said, this case completely flexible. It could also be, um, be non-triptych, uh, non- protest digested 
like uh, like peptides, whatever you want, basically. So just to remember, so what are the different uh, machine learning techniques you could actually use to predict the spectral library? So so very uh, very popular became these recurrent neural networks which is a deep learning uh, technology. Uh, it's also uh, very accurate in terms of results. The disadvantages might be that it takes longer to train them than conventional machine learning. And it's uh, therefore, because of that, not 100% flexible. And then you could just say, okay, I, I just uh, train different machine learning models for different uh, classes of, of length of peptides. As you see here, so you basically train uh, whatever support vector machine or uh, um, a multilayer perceptron for all peptides of length seven, then you make a new model for all peptides of length eight, then for nine, length nine, and so on and so forth. And uh, so that is easy and straightforward to do because you have like a fixed length vector that, that you work on, but uh, it's um, actually uh, not really um, uh, smart in terms of synergy that you can get out of your data because like the different length of peptides are not learning from each other. Uh, so that's what is realized in this MS2 PIP. Um, uh, algorithm and then so what we are doing now so we call, used to call it winner but it's actually now x um, xmas um, is uh, that we basically look uh, at for each peptide we go to every bond where y and b ions are produced and then we put a window of a thick fixed length around it and then we predict what is actually the relative height of um, this particular peak if this bond breaks so y or b based the so two peaks compared to the base peak of the spectrum, right? So it's, a, it's like a simplified task, but we will see that it, uh, its performance in terms of prediction is actually just as good as the deep learning models. Right, and you can also uh, predict your custom model. So we ship MaxQuant with a model that has been uh, trained on triptych peptides, uh, but you can also come in and say, oh, no, I use my own um, data, so for example, uh, you train it on uh, DDA data that was also analyzed with MaxQuant. And then you have here now this little pop-up window uh, where you can basically uh, say, uh, okay, I want to train with these modifications um, and I want to, uh, for example, take uh, these and these many uh, miscleavages into account and uh, we use this, this and this protease basically. So completely flexible in terms of uh, what this uh, machine learning model that is predicting your spectra actually knows so you can train it yourself and then you can best use it in max quant then as a custom model it's called not the, not the default model but uh, the custom model right so um let's uh, briefly compare so deep mass that was the old method that you had to download from a server x mass is the new uh, method so what are we predicting in the spectra so we also predict uh, neutral losses so we predict y and so this is now hcd and cid so we predict uh, Y and B, of course, but also the water losses and also the uh, ammonia losses. And we have two different models. So there's one model for uh, HCD intensities and one model for CID intensities. And actually surprisingly, we find that the HCD between um, Roker and Tom of Fish is actually uh, very similar. So one, at least so far, we're not training separate models uh, for these. So one can now look at, uh, so what could ask now, so how good are these predictions? And actually, so fundamentally two different ways of judging how good the predictions are. So one is that you uh, just take the true spectrum and the predicted spectrum, of course, with like train test validation split or cross validation or something like this, so that you're not overfitting. And uh, you can just look at what is the Pearson correlation or the spectral angle between the true and the predicted uh, spectrum. And then you uh, make a distribution of these, or you take the media of these. Uh, so there are different ways of analyzing this data. Uh, that is one way of looking at the performance. The other way of looking at the performance is by monitoring how many peptides and proteins do I identify on average uh, if I use this, this or that parameter setting in the um, in the algorithm. And so, so what are actually the parameters that we can optimize? So for XMERS, it's actually the, the parameters coming from the uh, the underlying XGBoost algorithm. And there's, uh, by the way, some uh, tree-based machine learning um, uh, model. Uh, and then, of course, the window sizes. And these ca can be different for the different series also. So we actually work with two, two window sizes. So one is for the Y and B ions. 
and then we have another window size for the neutral losses. So you might ask, you know, which one is um, larger and which one is smaller? So actually, we use uh, we use a larger window for the neutral losses because for those it actually matters which other amino acids or it matters a lot which other amino acids are actually in the window or somewhere consecutive in the peptide further away. Uh, so, so if they actually can lose water and ammonia, right? So that's why a large window is actually important for the neutral loss series. So that, that's what we predict and use. And uh, so what we what we see is actually, so I don't have a figure with me now, but so, so one can actually, um, looking at both of these criteria separately, so if you only look at the prediction quality, you can achieve the same prediction quality with actually boost compared to the current neural network. So it's actually not a big advantage or no advantage of um, in going into deep learning uh, for this actually. Uh, if you look at the number of identifications, one observes something interesting. It's actually not necessarily the best performing model in terms of accuracy that achieves the best um, identification rates actually, actually not the case, basically. And we observed that already in other places where we use machine learning in the DIA workflow, that does that does not have to coincide. And so if you then optimize uh, separately the uh, identification rate, we also see that we can get similar identification rates at, uh, as the recall neural network-based uh, method, but it might not be exactly the same parameter setting, surprisingly. Okay, so that uh, that is all in the new release. Uh, we also put in a new uh, retention time predictor and also a uh, um, iron mobility or one over K0 uh, predictor for uh, for TIMS of pro data. And uh, so these are of course also now predicted on the fly. And uh, so this uh, this new model is actually also based on XGBoost and it's actually based on the word counts in the like words of amino acids count in the sequence. And that actually also gave, uh, gave actually surprisingly quite some uh, uh, boost in uh, identification rates if we replaced both the uh, retention time and also the eye mobility prediction with the uh, uh, XGBoost uh, based. So long story short, we just love XGBoost. It's just doing wonders basically. Okay, so... Um, yeah, so then let's get to uh, multiplexed uh, DIA. So that's basically working very well now. Uh, no matter what kind of label you want to use, actually you can um, you can just um, uh, freely configure the labels as you also know it from DDA, MaxQuant, with Silec, Amtrak, whatever you name it, basically. You can also define your own labels here and experiment with the new ways of doing multiplexed DIA. And you just uh, define how many different uh, labels you have, have so uh, the level of multiplexing, and then for each of these, you can just whatever you want um, put in there, basically. So um, yeah. So and then for quantification later, it will actually then automatically determine. Uh, which fragments it can actually use for uh, quantification. So it's doing hybrid quantification, so it's using the precursor signal, of course, uh, but it's also using um, fragments. But then, of course, depending on the labels uh, that you're using, you cannot use all fragments. So sometimes you can only use the ones coming from one side of the peptides because the others are actually all the same for all of the different channels, right? So and then it, so Max1 figures this automatically out, which uh, fragments can be used, and then obviously only uses these then for quantification. Yeah, so um, then the first step is a multiplex spectral library match. So there's a spectral library. So it, now it would be usually the on the fly predicted library, but it could also be a DDA generated library. And basically, uh, so the only information um, MaxDIA takes from uh, these libraries is which uh, series ions that were produced, basically, right? So that's the only information. So it doesn't take any masses or labels uh, from from the library. So you could also have like a TMP generated library if you wanted to, and uh, use this then for um, for label free. It doesn't make sense, I know, but you could basically, right? There are probably better examples that make more sense. But so it's completely decoupled. What was the experiment in the library generation, and what is the experiment in DTA, basically? Then. Um, you can also restrict then the library match to uh, uh, like a, um, how do you call it, like a, like a um, reference channel, right? If you do a multiplex DIA with a reference channel, 
there might be um, it might be advantageous to only match to the reference channel spectra and have the others by MS1 feature um, multiplexing uh, found. But you don't have to. So completely, you could also search for all of them. Then I just multiplex in the library as well, basically. Right. Uh, so then the next step. So that is basically what you can identify with uh, library matches like MS2 to MS2, and of course the precursor mass. Um, the next step is then purely looking at the MS1 data, and there it does basically find these. Um, yeah, trip, like in this case, it would be triplex, could also be duplex, could also be quadruplex, uh, so you name it basically. And this is actually exactly the same algorithm as we were using in DDA, uh, where we were then also using, uh, trying to find select triplets to, to do quantification on. And we're doing here the same. And then the idea is if like one of these, or at least one of these, has an MSMS identification with fragments, let's say this one here was identified in the prior step with fragments, then it will take the whole triplex and you have uh, then the medium and heavy state also available for quantification. So this is for isotope patterns that were really completely uh, detected and are intact basically. Then there's a third step, uh, which is called requantify, which you might also know from uh, DDA max quant, uh, which is um, for the case where let's say you again have this uh, triplex and you have only find an, found an isotope pattern for one of the three and not for the other. So that could be because the signal in the others is very low abundant. And then it would actually um, take the integration boundaries from the one that was found, like the light one, for example, because it was a reference channel, and would then just integrate over the space and retention time, mass, and optionally also immobility, where you would the uh, medium and uh, heavy partners expect to be, basically. Right? So that's uh, really also one-to-one -one, uh, requantify from EDA. Okay, so then this all is then taken as input for the max LFQ algorithm. And uh, so this is now used actually in a hybrid quantification way. So it takes the intensities from the precursors and also from the fragments. And so if, uh, if you were using it in, uh, in, uh, in DDA, so you might remember or not, that it actually um, consists out of two uh, major steps. So one is the normalization step, basically where it kind of tries to determine one factor that all the intensities in one LCMS run are multiplied with, also works with prefractionation. And then the other one is protein quantification, where we try to get like the best information possible when we compare um, like two proteins with each other or one protein in two samples and try to basically uh, scale this up then to having many samples, thousand samples or something like this, right? So that's already the case, uh, has been the case for DDA. And uh, in DIA, we do know something very similar uh, with the only uh, difference that now for each peptide or peptide charge uh, modification combination, we have now multiple intensities. So we have the precursor intensities or not, could, could also not be found. And then for uh, several ion types, we have now intensities. And so these are actually changing from sample to sample. In one sample, you see Y5 and the other not, and so on and so forth. But then we use the same principle as the DDA uh, LFQ that we basically only take in pairwise comparisons, uh, those uh, fragments that are in common to both, where you can take a log ratio basically, take an median of these, and so on and so forth. But, but this uh, one has actually not naturally kind of integrated hybrid quantification into the label free quantification. Okay, then how does it work for multiplex DIA? So it's actually quite straightforward. So we just basically treat the different uh, labeling states as different samples. And otherwise we do exactly the same. So, um, so it applies to any kind of labeling and we treat each label in each LCMS uh, run as a sample. So what does that mean? Example, let's say we have 10 runs and three labels. So we treat this as, as if we had uh, 30 samples for the LFQ. And then the results are showing up in protein groups.txt as they would also show up for DDA data. All right, so let's uh, look a little bit at uh, if this is uh, working well or not. And so we have one uh, uh, one SILAC data set here, um, measured of, on TIPS of Pro, which uh, the Selbach uh, lab in Berlin provided us, which I think it also recently published, where basically in the light channel, 
always uh, human and E. coli was mixed in uh, different uh, ratios, basically. And then in the heavy channel, uh, you have a reference, basically, that is just a fixed uh, uh, amount mixed to them and always a little bit more, basically. So basically, one can now simulate uh, like completely label-free quantification without reference channel, but just ignoring this here, or basically having the reference channel as guidance, basically, to be able to dig out the the light um, channel signal out of the noise, basically, right? And um, yeah, without having much time to go into the details, you can see here, basically, the, the um, you saw there were five different mixing ratios, and out of these, we took a bunch where this is like the expected um, expected ratio um, between the, the um, labeled uh, populations. And this, then you see with the boss, um, the XD measured uh, ratio distribution, and you see it, it's all um, quite okay. And if you compare actually the label fee with the one with the reference channel, you will see that the numbers go up if you have the reference channel. So the reference channel indeed helps you quantifying more proteins from, uh, from the same sample. Right, then uh, the next improvement is what we call uh, sequence coverage increase. And uh, so that's that's like a very simple idea. You might have heard that also before uh, from other software packages, so to speak. So uh, basically we run uh, MaxDIA up to the place where we apply the protein FDR, right? So everything is as, uh, as was uh, up to protein FDR. And then we take those protein sequences that were identified uh, with 1% FDR and kind of make a new FASTA file out of these. And we only consider then these proteins in the next step, we then apply a new PSM or peptide FDR basically. And uh, so obviously this increases the number of peptides on already identified proteins. So it will not find new proteins, obviously. Um, so which leads then to, or uh, supposedly leads to better quantification just because you have more peptides. <laughs> and also, um, if you're interested in alternative splicing, that should also be able to resolve more isoforms from splicing because you might actually find uh, um, exon specific, uh, pep more exon specific peptides, but that also uh, splice junction covering peptides by this uh, sequence coverage increase. And um, yeah, so here on a standard orbitra uh, HeLa data set, you see what it does in terms of protein groups. So if we don't use uh, this um, this new feature, we get this number. If we use 1% FDR in this new um, kind of peptide level, FDR step, uh, we do get we do get 200 more. So why do we get more? Uh, because we are using now a smaller search space, which means uh, it will generate fewer false positives. Like in the space that was taken away, it cannot uh, produce um, false positives anymore. So that means uh, with the same scoring, um, the FDR um, thresholding will give you more proteins. And then we see if we if we are uh, less stringent with this peptide level FTR, we actually gain substantial um, amounts of uh, protein groups. So then the question is, uh, so what is this? I mean, it's not new protein sequences because they were actually not offered. So what this is, you can see if you map all of this to gene names. So if you go back to gene names and we take now the five percent, um, then you will see that. Um, in terms of gene names, actually almost no new protein coding genes were produced, but a lot of uh, protein groups, oh, sorry, but lots of um, um, gene names are actually unique to, uh, to, 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 to um, sorry, sorry, sorry. So a lot of protein groups are actually unique to this, uh, to this uh, new, newly created part of the, of the proteome. So, so there's evidence that we actually create uh, new, uh, new uh, isoforms created by splicing, but uh, actually not um, not new genes, obviously. So um, then the last new technical thing is this peptide correlations for each peptide in a protein group. Uh, we calculate an intensity profile over all the samples. So it is not yet with max LFQ, but rather rough, basically. And then we calculate from this a median intensity profile for this uh, protein group. And um, then um, we use only peptides that have at least a certain 
um, Spearman correlation we're actually using to this um, media profile of the protein group. So by that, basically kicking out outliers that were wrongly identified. Yeah, so um, yeah, so how does that all perform now? So for, us, for that, we take uh, another um, benchmark data set. Uh, so the other, the one before was from Timsoft. This is now from Astra, uh, produced in the Olsen lab. And you see that's uh, again a three species mixture, so that you know what the correct ratios are supposed to be. And um, so here you see the number of protein groups identified. And what you say, protein group counting is a science uh, for itself by itself. And I think we are rather strict and conservative with it because uh, we, for example, have uh, this razor peptide um, assignment that kind of uh, lowers the number, if anything. So this is the, the numbers um, from the paper. This is what we would achieve without this new feature. So it's actually already quite uh, quite comparable. If we do uh, this peptide correlation filtering on that, it's actually not filtering uh, much, basically. Presumably because uh, with stringent criteria, um, almost all of the peptides are correct anyway. Um, then if we go to sequence coverage increase, we get significantly more proteins. And um, so this is actually now with a 5% FDR. And then if you then on top of that apply again the uh, the peptide correlation filtering, this actually does something. So this actually takes out uh, um, miscorrelating or wrongly identified um, proteins. And then one can make uh, ratio benchmarks out of these. So they look pretty good. And uh, so this is also how you can decide what should be the FDR on the second uh, step? What should be the peptide FDR on there? And that's actually how we came to the conclusion that it should be 5%, because if you're using 5%, uh, we don't produce a significant amount of wrong ratios. So if you do 10% or 20%, we do actually see that there are many wrong peptides in there. So that's why, in the end, we fixed it to 5%. And um, yeah, so then, of course, the question is, are our uh, FDRs actually calculated correctly, in particular, the, the protein FDR? And so we checked with the entrapment searches where we basically take human samples, so again, the uh, standard orbit trap samples, and um, offer the in silico libraries for human and for RIBDOPSIS, and then taking some precautions uh, regarding common peptides and so on. And uh, so indeed, what we find is that uh, if we take the uh, our, our, our RIBDOPSIS identified protein groups as uh, false positives, we see that our false positives actually below 1% if we set it to 1%. It's more like uh, around yeah around 0.5 or something like that. So, so we are not um, in any way overfitting. If anything, uh, we are underfitting, if, if that term exists at all, I don't know. But so we are on the, on the good side of things, basically. OK, so um, then, so that's already in there since the previous release. So we have been working on uh, scalability a lot. And uh, for that, we have the batch processing implemented, uh, meaning that uh, basically the, like the first step where you can look at one uh, LCMS run or LCIMSMS run in uh, uh, by itself without knowing the others. So we're just like the peak detection, the isotoping, matching from the library, and so on and so forth. So this is done in batches. And actually, the, the intermediate results produced by that are then deleted so that you don't uh, fill up your disk, basically, with these. And um, the batches can be any size you like. So my standard is uh, 25. But so one special case, it could also be one. You could uh, basically uh, uh, put, um, analyze these files while they're coming out of the machine and then put them together later. <laughs> Right, and that, that's where you uh, get all of this. So the version 261 is outside my uh, students working a lot in the last day, so that's actually ready for today. Actually, it was already ready yesterday, but replaced it with, with something that was working better. Uh, so get uh, 261. Right out, please. Um, I think you will be pleased uh, with most of the things going on. If not, then tell us what we can uh, still improve. So what are the next things coming? Um, so we have PTM localization uh, coming out very soon, uh, probably sometime. 
um, after ASMS, and then we have another thing in the pipeline, uh, which is fragment peak indexing. So this is basically a method um, where we think that will make the search as much faster. So it's a little bit uh, the method that it's also used in MS Fragger that you basically index uh, fragments there. And that is already uh, showing promising results there. Right, so uh, last but not least, I, of course, have to thank many people on my group, uh, obviously, who did all the work. And if you want to uh, learn more about this and other things, we have the Max Planck Summer School coming up in uh, September, and it's uh, going to be in Munich this, um, and this year, and the registration is already open. And uh, with that, I thank you for your attention, and I think we can take some questions. Thank you very much, Jürgen. We have time for maybe a couple of questions. We have them right here. Jürgen, could you comment on the question of multiplexing of DIA? How many flexes do you think are feasible given that each flex multiplies the number of clients that we have to first detect and then quantify? Yes, and so I don't have a definite answer. I mean, there are. Um... <laughs> promising uh, results for plexes up to three, where it looks like it's actually not reducing the depth, right? Which which is actually, for me, it was surprising because I know from DDA, it was actually strongly reproducing the depth, but that is not the case in um, in VIA. But I think we don't know much more be, beyond uh, triplex, uh, quadruplex or something like this, right? So I think that's also an open question for me. I do think that at some point, let's say use 20 plexes or so, it has to hurt the depth of um, identification and quantification, but I don't know where exactly the sweet spot or the turning point is located. So I'm also very curious to see that. Yeah, um, great to actually see all these improvements now. Um, um, in, in MaxPond. Um, question regarding the prediction. Um, you said uh, it, it doesn't matter what kind of um, enzyme you use, um, it works for any type of enzyme. Mm -hmm. Does it also work well for um, unspecific? So look, going in the direction of immunopeptidomics and things like that, or where the bottleneck mm -hmm. in the natural search space gets too big? Yeah, I guess there, there are a couple of things to consider. So, uh, I mean, that you can use uh, any enzyme and also unspecific that that's of course true in principle i mean that's how everything is set up basically however if you want to use unspecific you should use a custom made predictor which you can do as i showed you right so you have to train it yourself and uh, just throw in the custom uh, predictor and so that's all good basically uh, so one has to be at some point one has to be worried about the search space a little bit um where you might have an advantage in either DDA or spectrum-centric approaches that we're also looking into at the moment. Um, but theoretically, this is all working. So you might have to restrict your search space a little bit at the moment. Uh, but I think we have many things coming up regarding scalability, and that's definitely a goal that we want to achieve. I think, uh, Nick, I'll have our last question. Hey, Jürgen, it's great to see the increased support for FlexDI. I have a question for peptides that are labeled with the new different types of MOSFETs when predicting their fragmentation using text books. Do we have to use windows that are large enough to encompass the entire peptide? Because a label on the N terminus or the C terminus of a peptide can influence fragmentation of the peptide. How do we? deal with those longer term instances. Yeah, uh, yeah, one has to think about how one does it. So it depends on how homogeneous these labels are, right? So, I mean, if they are, uh, can be all treated the same, um, then I think uh, it doesn't have any implication on the prediction model because by just training on this particular class of peptides, it would actually know, okay, this is going to happen at the C-terminus always, basically. Then it will just uh, relearn all of the intensities based, based on that, right? If, however, this um, this uh, label is diverse, then one has to think about how one exactly specifies it. So it could be by specifying them as modifications for the task of learning, basically. And then, so it, so like the model also takes into account modifications. And that way um, you could actually 
also uh, learn this in one model, I, I would say, basically. Um, if it turns out to be more complex, I guess we have to get on the Zoom again and talk about it. Thank you.